It's the Bard Knox Life. Hey everybody, it is uh, actually that time of year again, and why I say that, obviously Christmas. And I know I've been talking about Christmas a lot, but uh, I decided, you know, there's something I've really wanted to do for a long time. And that is create my own audiobook versions of some very famous stories like Chronicles of Narnia and Lord of the Rings. But I don't just want to do a straight audiobook the same way I do audio adventures, although that would be great. Uh, because, you know, it's still kind of copyrighted and things of that nature. And even though it's not that big a deal and people make fan versions, you know, in audiobooks all the time, uh, I wanted to try and do commentary along with the story. You know, Narnia in particular, where I'm going to be starting today, is such a huge part of my childhood, the way I grew up. My father read them to me. I've talked about that a few times. Um, but I, I thought I'd just go ahead and crack the book open and read it and talk about it as we go along and just see how it goes. You know, um, we're going to start with chapter one, uh, which is, I believe, hold on, what was the, I should know these chapters by heart, the name. Yeah, Lucy looks into a wardrobe. That's what I thought. Chapter one, Lucy looks into a wardrobe. And as I read through this, you know, this is a Christmas story. This is one of my favorite Christmas stories. Um, what with Christ coming, you know, the the, the witch's thaw. Uh, a lot of people don't necessarily think of it as a Christmas story. I most definitely do. I mean, Father Christmas is in it. Um, but I just, I thought we would just begin and see where this goes. Um, I might still do some other episodes here and there when I have a specific topic, but this gives me something to keep doing for a little while and something that... You know, we can comment on as we go, talk about what's going on with my life, just keep it moving. So we're going to start with one. Lucy looks into a wardrobe. Once there were four children whose names were Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. This, this is one of the most iconic opening lines ever. It's just such a simple opening line. And uh, honestly, I judge a lot of modern fantasy based upon like this line. Uh, I think in the hole in the ground there lived a hobbit isn't is one of the others, but we'll get to that one eventually. This story is about something that happened to them when they were sent away from London during the war because of the air raids. They were sent to the house of an old professor who lived in the heart of the country, ten miles from the nearest railway station and two miles from the nearest post office. I like the rural reckoning of space there. It's just a nice little touch, kind of makes you feel cozy and settling in. He had no wife, and he lived in a very large house with a housekeeper called Mrs. McCready and three servants. Their names were Ivy, Margaret, and Betty, but they do not come into the story much. One little Easter egg for those who have read That Hideous Strength. We've got, um, I want to say it was Margaret, either Ivy or Margaret. It could have been Betty, but I think it was Ivy or Margaret. Uh, as a, a housekeeper type that he used again. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting, um, him using it in Narnia later. Um, he himself was a very old man with shaggy white hair, which grew over most of his face as well as on his head. And they, were li and they liked him almost at once. But on the first evening, when he came out to meet them at the front door, he was so odd-looking that Lucy, who was the youngest, was a little afraid of him, and Edmund, who was the next oldest, next youngest, wanted to laugh and had to keep on pretending he was blowing his nose to hide it. I've loved that little joke forever, and I, I don't know why it never comes into any of the film adaptations. <laughs> it might have been in the BBC, I don't remember. I haven't seen the BBC version in forever. But it's just such a fun, simple visual gag that, like, you could get it pretty quickly. I don't know why they never use it. It's so funny. As soon as they had said that good night to the professor and gone upstairs on the first night, the boys came into the girls' room and they all talked it over. We've fallen on our heads and make no mistake, said Peter. This is going to be perfectly splendid. That old chap will let us do anything we like. I think he's an old dear, said Susan. Oh, come off it said Edmund, who was tired and pretending not to be tired. Oh, come off it, said Edmund, who was tired and pretending not to be tired, which always made him bad-tempered. 
don't go on talking like that. Like what? said Susan. And anyway, it's time you were in bed. Trying to talk like mother, said Edmund. And who are you to say when I'm got to go to bed? Go to bed yourself. Hadn't we all better get to bed? said Lucy. There's sure to be a row if we're he heard talking here. No, there won't, said Peter. I'll tell you this is the sort of house where no one's going to mind what we do. Anyway, they won't hear us. It's about ten minutes' walk from here down to the dining room, and any amount of stairs and passages in between. What's that noise? said Lucy suddenly. It was a far larger house than she had ever been in, and the thought of all those long passages and rows of doors leading into empty rooms was beginning to make her feel a little creepy. Yeah, that's that's one of those things that I feel like they never really got in the movies either, um, was this sense of foreboding of the actual house. Mm -hmm. um, sure, there was a sense of wonder, but there was also foreboding. There's this, It's huge. You never know what you're going to find in there. So... Uh, moving forward. It's only a bird, silly, said Edmund. It's an owl, said Peter. This is going to be a wonderful place for birds. I shall go to bed now. I say, let's go and explore tomorrow. You might find anything in a place like this. Did you see those mountains as we came along? And the woods? There might be eagles. There might be stags. There'll be hawks. Badgers, said Lucy. Foxes, said Edmund. Rabbits, said Susan. But when next morning came, there was a steady rain falling, so thick that when you looked out of the window, you could see neither mount the mountains, nor the woods, nor even the stream in the garden. Of course, it would be raining. That's actually a quote that my family has used over and over and over throughout the years. Of course, it would be raining. We use it, we wake up, if it's raining, we use that. Uh, it's just a little reference joke that we do. They had just finished their breakfast with the professor and were upstairs in the room he had set apart for them, a long, low room with two windows looking out in one direction and two in another. Mm. Do stop grumbling, Ed, said Susan. Ten to one, it'll clear up in an hour or so. And in the meantime, we're pretty well off. There's a wireless and lots of books. I, I get so many questions from kids when I read this to kids. My kids included, what's a wireless? <laughs> <laughs> it's a wireless radio, something that you don't have plugged into the wall for reception and all that kind of stuff. It runs on batteries, etc. <clears throat> Not for me, said Peter. I'm going to explore the house. Everyone agreed to this, and that was how the adventures began. It was the sort of house that you never seemed to come to the end of, and it was full of unexpected places. The first few doors they tried led only into spare bedrooms, as everyone had expected they would. But soon they came to a long room full of pictures, and they were and, and there they found a suit of armor. And after that room, all hung with green, with a harp in one corner, and then came three steps down and five steps up, and then a kind of little stair, a little upstairs hall, and a door that led out onto a balcony, and then a whole series of rooms that led into each other and were lined with books, most of them very old books, and some of them bigger than a Bible in a church. That's that's another kind of anachronistic phrase that I like. Um, you know, bi the, the Bible is in a church. That's specific to, you know, uh, Catholic churches and Anglican churches that would have a Bible on the pulpit, you know, all the time. Sometimes it would even be chained there um, for preaching purposes and that sort of a thing. Very special Bibles that would be, you know, specifically there for the preacher or whatever. Um and shortly after that, they looked into a room that was quite empty except for one big wardrobe, the sort that has a looking glass in the door. There was nothing else in the room except, at all except the, a dead blue bottle on the windowsill, blue bottle being a beetle. Nothing there, said Peter, and they all trooped out again, all except Lucy. She stayed behind because she thought it would be worthwhile trying the door of the wardrobe even though she felt almost sure that it would be locked. To her surprise, it opened quite easily, and two mothballs dropped out. Looking into the inside, she saw several coats hanging up, mostly long fur coats. There was nothing Lucy liked so much as the smell and feel of fur. I've never found fur coats particularly good smelling, <laughs> but as far as the feel, I would agree. 
She immediately stepped into the wardrobe and got in among the coats and rubbed her face against them, leaving the door open, of course, because she knew that it is very foolish to shut oneself up into any wardrobe. Yet another thing that we quote all the time, any anytime, you know, a kid's closing themselves in a closet or something, we it's very foolish to shut oneself up. <laughs> Um, I thought that was funny, C.S. Lewis essentially putting a safety warning there. It makes sense why he did. It's just, it's funny to me. Little safety warnings in a kid's book. Um, <clears throat> Soon she went in for, further in and found that there was a second row of coats hanging up behind the first one. It was almost quite dark in there, she, and th- in there, and she kept her arms stretched out in front of her so as to not bump her face into the back of the wardrobe. She took a step further in, then two or three steps, always expecting to feel woodwork against the tips of her fingers. But she could not feel it. This must be a simply enormous wardrobe, thought Lucy, going still further in and pushing the soft folds of the coats aside to make room for her. I love the the little ridiculousnesses. Uh, That's not a word, but you know what I mean. uh, In this segment, like she's still just like, oh, this is just normal. Just a huge word of room. <laughs> and meanwhile, something crazy and cosmic is happening. And I wonder how much that happens to us as we go on in life, where something crazy and cosmic is happening around us and we don't even notice it. <clears throat> then she noticed that there was something crunching under her feet. I wonder, is that more mothballs? She thought, stooping down to feel it with her hand. But instead of feeling the hard, smooth wood of the floor of the wardrobe, she felt something soft and powdery and extremely cold. This is very queer, she said, and went, a step, went on a step or two further. Next moment, she found that she was rubbing against her face and hands. What she was rubbing against her face and hands was no longer soft fur, but something hard and rough and even prickly. "'Why, it's just the branches of trees!' exclaimed Lucy. And then she saw that there was a light ahead of her, not uh, not a few inches away where the back of the wardrobe ought to have been, but a long way off. Something cold and soft was falling on her. A moment later she found that she was standing in the middle of a wood at nighttime, with snow under her feet and snowflakes falling through the air. Lucy felt a little frightened but she felt very inquisitive and excited as well. She looked back over her shoulder, and there, between the dark tree trunks, she could still see the open doorway of the wardrobe and even catch a glimpse of the empty room from which she had set out. She had, of course, left the door open, for she knew that it is very silly, a very silly thing to shut oneself into a wardrobe. I love how he keeps repeating it, too, almost as if he wants the children, repeat after me, do not shut yourself up in a wardrobe! <laughs> It seemed to be still daylight there. I can always get back if anything goes wrong, thought Lucy. She began to walk forward, crunch, crunch over the snow and through the wood toward the light. In about ten minutes, she reached it and found it was a lamp post. As she stood looking at it, wondering why there was a lamp post in the middle of the wood and wondering what to do next, she heard a pitter-powder of feet coming toward her. And soon after that, a very strange person stepped out from among the trees into the light of the lamppost. He was only a little taller than Lucy herself, and he carried over his head an umbrella, white with snow. From the waist upward, he was like a man, but his legs were shaped like a goat's. The hair on them was glossy black. And instead of feet, he had goat's hoofs, and also had a tail. He also had a tail. But Lucy did not notice this at first because it was neatly caught up over the arm that held the umbrella so as to keep it from trailing in the snow. He had a red woolen muffler round his neck and his skin was rather reddish too. He had a strange but pleasant face with a short pointed beard and curly hair and out of the hair there stuck two horns, one on each side of his forehead. One of his hands, as I have said, held the umbrella. In the other arm, he carried several brown paper parcels. What with the parcels and the snow, it looked just as if he had been doing his Christmas shopping. He was a fawn, and when he saw Lucy, he gave such a start of surprise that he dropped all his parcels. "'Goodness gracious me!' exclaimed the fawn. That's the end of chapter one. Uh, It's such 
an amazing start to a story. We start in our normal world, and by the end of the first chapter, we're somewhere so completely different, and yet somehow so familiar. This picture of this fawn in the forest is something that so easily gets uh, driven up in our mind. It, it's something that is so easy to imagine the way that he describes it. It's such a clear visual picture, and yet I, don't, I doubt any of us have ever actually seen it before. Yet somehow it feels familiar as if we've seen it before. It's, it's very strange how iconic this particular image of the fawn carrying the parcels in the wood has become. But uh, yeah, we have a lot more to go through this. I've really enjoyed our time doing this, and we're going to continue to do this and to work our way through Narnia for now. Um, we might change before we end the series, but I'm going to go through in the publishing order, like everyone should, the original publishing order, and not the current uh, uh, weird chrono chrono chronological order. Especially because it's Christmas, and this is such a wonderful Christmas story. So, thank you all for joining me. It's, a bard it's the Bard Knox Life. I gotta get that right. It's the Bard Knox Life. It's the Bard Knox Life. We'll talk to y'all soon.